Hey, we're back. It's Monday night, and it's time for VoiceOver Body Shop. Great guest tonight, Phil Proctor from the Fireside Theater and all sorts of other cool stuff. And we're going to talk about narration and improv and his career and all sorts of cool stuff. You got a pile of tech stuff, don't you? Yeah, we do. We got tech news. I've got some uh, gripes and some thoughts. Hmm. And we're going to talk about headphones versus studio monitors. Coming right up on VoiceOver Body Shop. Two men, twin sons from different mothers, with a passion for voiceover recording technology and the desire to make recording easy for voice actors everywhere. Together, in one place. George Whittem, the home studio engineer to the stars, a Virginia Tech grad with an unmatched knowledge of all the latest gear and technology in voiceover today. Dan Leonard, the home studio master, a voice actor with over 30 years experience in broadcasting and recording, and a no holds barred myth busting attitude for teaching you how easy it is. Together, to bring you all the latest technology, today's voiceover superstars, and leading the discussion on how to make the most of your voiceover business. This is VoiceOver Body Shop. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan's signature products. Source elements, remote connections made even easier. VO2GoGo.com, everything you need to be a successful voiceover artist. J. Michael Collins Demos, award-winning demo production. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your voiceover website won't be a pain in the butt. And VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live from their super secret multimedia studio in Sherman Oaks, California, here are George Whittem and Dan Leonard. Hi there, I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop. Or VO BS. All right. Okay, well, we're back after. You know, like one show in three weeks. It's funny so, how when we take one show off, it feels like a month. Month, yeah. You know, and it's <laughs> to like, me. all right, how do we do this again? <laughs> God, Cameras, lights, uh, microphones, yeah. push this button, that Action. sort of thing. Yeah, there we go. You know, it's like now it's official. Yes, and it's live, and you're joining us on a Monday night, and we've got Phil Proctor with us tonight, uh, joining us again in We're the gonna, flesh. In the flesh. <laughs> He's going to be, this is going to be great. It's going to be a great conversation. He's got a lot to cover. He's got a, his book is out. He's been doing a podcast, all sorts of cool stuff. Hmm. And nice. uh, you're going to be covering, it looks like a large list of stuff in the tech update. Somebody's got to fill time. I, well, yeah, but <laughs> hopefully people are coming in because that's what they want to hear. <laughs> anyway, we'll get to all that. But right now it's time for... Voice of Body Shop presents the VOBS Voice Over Extra News. All the information you need for a successful voiceover career. And here's the Voice Over Extra News for June 18th, 2018. Negotiating rates. If you enjoy negotiating voiceover rates with your clients, raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> or send a quick yes to us in the chat room. For everyone else, here's how to ditch the angst whenever you have to talk money. Our friend and VO pro Dan Hurst shares with us his plan on how to behave. And when we mean that, we mean it quite literally. He's created a short checklist for us to remember based on the letters in behave. Hmm. Dan recognizes that negotiating rates is one of the most awkward and difficult things for most VO talent to deal with. His article about this with many details is now on VoiceOver Extra, and here are highlights, Dan. All right, starting with the letter B, which is for budgets. Ask the client what their VO budget is. It's a simple question and an easy way to broach the subject. Almost every client will have a budget in mind, we think. Hmm. Uh, next, the letter E for expectations. What does the client expect from you? What's the scope of the job? Clear up any misunderstandings about what the client wants and what you think the client wants. Now go to H 
for history. What does the client normally pay for talent? Never be intimidated by what they were, were paying. Usually, when a client makes a VO change, they understand they may have to pay a little more, but also have options for the higher fee, if necessary, for instance, recording some phone messages for free. Mm -hmm. The letter A brings us to annual. See if you can get a retainer, for instance, negotiate a rate for a certain number of spots per month for a year. This is an ongoing, if it's an ongoing project, that is. Next is the V for value, Dan. Find a way to explain the new to the new client what additional value you bring to the job. You can start by asking, why do you want to use me? And if the client's reply doesn't mention all of the advantages you offer, then fill in the blanks. <laughs> and finally, E is for experience. What can you offer to make the job a great experience for the client? For instance, would you like to listen in while you record? Sure, that can be a pain, but also a great way to quickly focus on what the client wants. There's much more detail about all this in Dan's article, now at voiceoverextra.com, along with many hundreds of additional helpful articles. Visit there daily for your voice over success. All right. I well, like those little mnemonic, what do they call I those it's mnemonics? A, oh, we, I we have a question, a question from the audience from here. From the peanut hey, gallery. Why, why don't you spell it behavior with an R and ask about residuals? Ooh, Ooh, good question. Yeah, I don't think he was talking union on that. Behavior. Oh, oh, oh well. I'm no, going to leave the studio now. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. no, but Dan Hurst always one of the smartest guys in the business. Mm -hmm. He really understands what, what's going on out there and how to behave, and that's why he came up with that mnemonic. Yeah, and we do have a split audience. You know, we have an acrostic. The I'm not sure, actually. Uh, Some one of you guys might know this. Okay. One of you smart guys. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we do have a split audience. Some of you are non-union. Many, probably the majority of you, because we cover the entire world with this show, many of you are not. But for some, some that are union, residuals are definitely something you want to make sure you can get when possible. Right. Even if you're not union, say, give me residuals. Might as well ask. I, good luck with that one. Yeah. So what's new in the tech world? Well, I'll start right off by saying thank you to Jack Daniel, who, who loaned me an MXL uh, CR89 microphone. Not one of the better-known mics, but then again, most of MXL mics are not better-known. Not the greatest at marketing they are over there at MXL. But um, it's a mic I'd seen at NAMM show a few years ago, and I was pretty happy with it. It sounds a lot like my 20-year-old MXL 1006, but a little bit nicer. And I hope to get around to doing a uh, like a little... George the Tech review of that mic soon so you guys can hear it like in full quality and in context of what a good mic should sound like in a studio environment. Right. So well, you, you left it here and I got to use it in a webinar. And how'd it go? Did a nice job? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, good, it's a good condenser mic. It's yeah. clean. It's very, very heavy. And very we'll talk heavy. about a way later that you can yes. help support your heavy mic. Uh, but anyway, um, I, I, a couple weeks ago, I mentioned the Audient ID22 audio indeed. interface as mm -hmm. being somewhat problematic for a few clients. And one issue just came uh, amazingly after it being sent out to repair, um, tech support being involved. Mm -hmm. I was involved. After all of that, the client went and bought another unit, and we still had problems. The end result of a lot of frustration and gnashing of teeth was the power supply. And the Audient ID22, like a lot of interfaces like it, has an external power supply. Wall, wart, line lump, whatever the heck you call it. It's got one of those. Turns out when he got his new Audient, it plugged it in. He was using the existing power supply from the old one, which made um, sense. Just plug it in and go. You'd think it'd be fine. But no. Turns out it was the power supply. Uh, but now this, this unit was sent back to, uh, sent out to, for service. The service department didn't think of this. The audience company didn't think of this. The guy that he paid to support it didn't think of this. None of us thought to try another power supply. And in the end, he made it just a random switch, just thought, you know, what the heck? And that was the problem. So the moral of that story is, if you have a piece of equipment and it's acting funny, in his case, the signal was coming in a little distorted mm -hmm. and it would never reach zero dB. It would just always clip just shy of zero. We couldn't figure out why. It was starved for power. It's a, it's a techie thing, but it's a starving, a power supply is starving the unit for power. Right. So if you have distortion and you can't figure out why, there's no sense in it, the, the gain's not too high, whatever, 
it could be the power supply. So that's what we found there. Um, so always check your power, power supply, supply is the rule of that. So um, rule of that lesson. Um, another thing I've run into lately is I pulled out a piece of gear sort of kind of out of the mothballs. Once in a while, I pull equipment out of a studio that I installed myself some time ago, but then thanks to drivers falling behind and technical issues with gear, I'll get it, it becomes less reliable. Let me just reach down and get it before I fall over. And... <laughs> Thanks. Well, I brought this one in because it's just kind of cool looking. And this is the Tascam UH-7000. And this doesn't look probably like any USB interface you're familiar with. If you're thinking of the yeah, Scarlett 2i2. On the, on the, on the yeah, if you're thinking of any of those pieces of gear out there, this probably doesn't look like just about any of them. But what I like about it is the industrial design of this unit. It just looks, it looks like a piece of like audiophile gear. It's heavy. It's well built. Like an old Marantz stereo. Yeah, it like is. exactly. They're going for that Marantz look. The knobs are really well made. All, everything on this thing, quality was definitely a major focus. It's got a really good headphone amplifier, puts out tons of gain, these nice VU meters. And another little subtle thing about it, all the LEDs, which I know you can't see, that's not plugged in. They don't blind you when they turn on. Like, how much stuff do you buy these days where the lights on the unit is almost blinding? You have to put tape over the dang things in your studio. All these LEDs aren't overly bright. They're like a perfect brightness. Then on the back, it's all like high-quality XLR jacks where, where they should be. It's got AES input over here, which many of you aren't going to need. I, I know that AES is not that popular. It's digital, but it's got... Um, proper XLR in and out for everything. And another interesting thing is this gigantic power plug on the back. It has a built-in power supply. So chances of the internal power supply being bad are far, far less because this thing, the power supply was built by Tascam and it's integrated for this into unit. the system. Yeah. yeah, it's integrated in the unit. So it's, it's their own power supply. It's not something that's been OEM'd or bought from China and thrown, you know, just thrown in the box, which can sometimes happen. So it's a really nice piece of gear. It sounds great. Um, it's got interesting features like built-in processing. And we always talk about the Yamaha right. AG03 uh, because mm. of those processors. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of that stuff. Mm. But real quickly, I'm going to say this. Here's the features and here's the bugs. So features-wise, audio file look, build quality, it's obvious. Tons of microphone preamp gain. I don't remember what the spec is, but I think it's well north of 65 dB of gain. So... It should work with an SM7B or something yeah. like that without too much trouble. Um, great internal monitor mixer, which can be used to do play a loopback, which is kind of cool, right? We always talk about if you want to do playback to a client, it'll do that. It can also record the entire mix. So if you're actually a coach and you want to record this person on Skype, it will do that. It'll just record whatever the mix is, right. which is kind of cool. Um, not a lot of stuff can do that. Internal processing, like I said, it has DSP. But the weird thing about the DSP is it has EQ and it's got compression and gates and high pass filters and all this stuff. It'll only let you use one of those features at a time, one at a time, which is really strange because, well, a lot of times you want to use more than one. So I guess they were a little bit starved for DSP power when they built the unit however many years ago. And that's an unfortunate uh, thing. Um, Driver updates, again, I pulled this out of a studio using High Sierra Mac OS because we had some glitches and they were really slow to get their drivers up to date. I checked recently and it does seem to be current now on High Sierra. But really, when you use gear like this, especially high-end gear where drivers may not be updated constantly, do not update your systems. Just keep them locked down until you know everything is being supported. And lastly, um, a little weird, weird thing, but the phantom power. It's not an on-off switch where you click it on and click it off. Mm -hmm. You have to, every time you use phantom power, hold down a button on the front panel until phantom power turns on. That's every single time you turn it on. All right. So that's an annoying little that, that, thing yeah. about it. But anyway, that's the Tascam UH-7000, about 400 bucks. Oh, that's Very cool. high quality that's still, audio. still available? Yeah, still current, and the sound quality on input and output is, is fantastic. Fantastic. For you real nerds out there... Burr Brown op amps. Burr Brown op amps. I got a thumb and thumbs up in the audience okay. there for that one. All right, now, now, what's this thing about China bans ASMR videos <laughs> citing vulgarity and pornographic content? What is this about? I had to throw this in there. I mean, uh, you guys have 
by now seen an ASMR video. Have Have you not? I have, have you no seen idea. the ones where I don't people, know what you kids are watching these days. People I, whisper into the microphone. They speak extremely softly and whisper. They like to use a lot of mouth noise so mm-hmm. that the video is purposely full of mouth clicks and you spend they way too much time on YouTube. Their fingers right, over yeah, right. bed sheet, all yeah. sorts of weird stuff. This right. is called ASMR. I can't Google it. ASMR. I, I don't remember what it stands for, but apparently China thinks some of these videos are so vulgar. Absolutely stupid, moronic. This radio. is not <laughs> porn, by the way. This is not porn. This is just people talking in a soft, whispering voice and touching and clicking the microphone and doing little things like that. Right. China says this is pornographic and has banned it. They probably think someone's sending them secret messages (laughs) from the capitalist West. It's so crazy. Anyway, I just stumbled on that little piece and I had to get that out there. Thank you for, thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. That was definitely different. All right. Phil Proctor's coming up in just a couple of minutes. We're going to have a little debate about headphones versus studio monitors right after these messages. So stay tuned to Voice Over Body Shop. Yeah. Hi, this is Carlos Ellis Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching Voice Over Body Shop. Thank you. Yep, this is VOBS. Proven anybody can have a show these days. Hey guys, this is Tom, also known as the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants, and you want to fill your ear holes and your eye holes with Dan and George and the Audio Body Shop. Ah! Snails like it too. Wow. Hey guys, this is Tom, also known as the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants, and you want to fill your ear holes and your eye holes with Dan and George and the Audio Body Shop. Ah! You want to be an audiobook narrator, but you don't know where to turn for the best training? And the truth about working successfully with ACX? Well, here's your golden ticket. Registration for the 2018 ACX Home Study Audiobook Masterclass is now open for a limited time at acxmasterclass.com forward slash forward slash. Is that my cue? Yes. Register. You'll get four weeks of absolutely transformational training via audio, video, and online with support every step of the way. You'll be led by David H. Lawrence the 17th and Dan O'Day, whose past students have narrated and produced close to 3,000 audiobooks on the ACX platform. Go to acxmasterclass.com forward slash register. And when you register before 9 p.m. Pacific on Tuesday, July 19th, that's tomorrow, David and Dan will pay your first $500 of your tuition. So act fast. ACXMasterclass.com forward slash register. Do what you've dreamed of doing. Narrating audiobooks as part of your VO portfolio. Go to ACXMasterclass.com forward slash register. That's ACXMasterclass.com forward slash register. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. And we're back! Yay! Uh, voice of your body shop. Yes. Uh, Phil Proctor is coming up in just a couple of minutes. We're going to have a great time talking with him. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that it always bugs me when I'm talking to people, and you and I talk to a lot of people, you and I probably talk to more people about their home studios than anybody else on God's green earth. <laughs> and I think that is actually probably the truth. I believe that is true. You know, combined thousands and thousands of customers satisfied. Mm-hmm. Uh, but not billion served, but we're working on it. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, one of the things that, uh, that, that people always ask me about, what headphones should I get? Mm-hmm. And that leads to a couple of questions. Like, 
why wear headphones? Mm -hmm. You know, or what's your budget? Yeah. You know, now this is all prompted because I bought a new pair of uh, monitors. Well, let me ask you first. Yes. Why? Because I wanted to donate my old KRK Rocket 5s to somebody else. So you need an excuse to buy new it ones. It worked. And, um, <laughs> That's what it was. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I, I, had, I, w I went to an event last week where they were demonstrating some Atom monitors. And yeah, I really A -D -A -M, wanted. A-D-A-M. Yes, Atom. Yeah. Atom. Yeah. They're, and they're, they're, here, they're made here in L.A., I think. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I went over to uh, Banjo Emporium and I said, let me listen to the And they convinced me the Yamahas were much better, and they were crisp and clean, and they were really, really good. Mm -hmm. uh, the Atoms were good, too, though. Yeah. But they were the same price, and I'm like, well, the Yamaha. There was something in the low mid-range or something? Something there that worked. Anyway. Yeah. But I like having studio monitors because the power that they have, they deliver exactly back what you record. Mm -hmm. So when you're playing back your file, you know exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear exactly what you said with all... All of the, all of the the subtleties uh, of your audio there. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot to be said for headphones. You give me your why you think headphones are a better idea. Well, yeah, it depends on the context that you're using them for. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I have them carefully perched on one ear so I can hear Dan without okay. the head. So this is an example, right? Right now, I'm using headphones. Why am I using headphones? Because I want to hear. What's going out on the air is act, you know, not, maybe not as accurately as possible, but I want to hear what's going out on the air because I need to hear the mix of everything. Right. So in this case, I'm doing two jobs. I'm on air or on camera talent and I'm audio engineer. Right. So in this case, it's kind of tough. I'm doing two jobs. Right. I really want to hear what's going on, but I don't want to have to be fully enclosed in headphones all the time. So right. I'm doing the one ear, one off technique. If you're voice acting, having headphones on both ears all the time is not necessarily a great thing when you're in the process of learning the act, the craft of voice acting. Right. But when you're editing audio and listening to audio critically, closely, and trying to make a determination as to what should be in, what should be in an edit, where the edit point should be, mm -hmm. sometimes headphones can be better. And the reason I think that is because many people don't have a great monitoring environment. Right. You know, that's uh, and, the problem. And, and that's the thing. You know, now my studio is set up acoustically so I can hear properly out in the studio, out yeah. in my workspace. This room is very nicely acoustically tuned. It has a nice high ceiling. And so you're not going to get a whole lot of color, coloration right. from the room. And the same way a microphone interacts with the room, the speakers interact with the room. So the two of them are going to, you know, they're going to correlate and cause issues the same way a microphone does just sort of in reverse. But if you're going to get monitors, get good ones, if you can afford them. Mm -hmm. If you get headphones, what type of headphones should you get? I mean, you know, of course we have a sponsor that makes fantastic well, there headphones. there is the Harlan Hogan, yeah, yeah, the Signature Series headphones. Yeah, so which, what's nice about great, these the is they were, they were voiced to be relatively flat, not have a lot of color to them. They're not designed to be exciting sounding for music. A lot of music headphones or headphones oriented for music use have a lot of bright top end or overly bright top end and they have too much bass as well they call it, i call it the eq disco smile because the treble is way up on one end and the bass is way up on the other um, and a lot of headphones do that beats <laughs> beats uh <laughs> those beats headphones um boy they're really bad that way so these headphones like these are, are not designed to not have a lot of that coloration um, there's other ones, AKG 240s. Uh, I like the direct sound uh, uh, isolation headphones. Direct sound, they're okay. Very, very good. Uh, yeah. They're actually made for drummers, but they're really, really flat, mm -hmm. which I think is also appropriate to the studio monitors you get. They also deliver a nice flat response. And that's really, you it, You don't want any coloration. You want to hear exactly what it was that you recorded. Yeah, studio monitors aren't designed to be, again, they're not designed to be exciting sounding, right. like for listening to music. They're designed to be accurate. Right. So you might put your favorite CD that you listened to 100 times up on some brand new studio monitors. You might be a little disappointed at first. You mm -hmm. might go, it doesn't sound a lot, a lot of, where's the bass? Where's the sizzle of the cymbal? You know, it doesn't sound as right. exciting. Well, they're not designed to, to be exciting. They're designed to be relatively accurate. All right. So, all right. So, not a knock them out, drag them out. I think you and I actually agree on all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, you just have to know your whatever you're monitoring on, whether it's speakers, headphones, whatever brand they are, however much they you paid for them, you need to know them. 
Mm -hmm. They need to be familiar to you. You need to listen to them. Listen to a lot of familiar sources on them. Music, uh, podcasts, uh, NPR, whatever the radio you listen to all the time. Listen to stuff you know really well. Right. And then listen to your own voice, of course, as well, if, you, if you're familiar with editing your own voice. Right. If, if it sounds familiar, it just sounds like there's nothing boomy about them or to this or to that, you know, you should be okay. And just yeah. learn the way they'll, and that way they'll translate from whatever you do to the rest of the world. That's what matters, no matter whether they're speakers or headphones. Absolutely. We got a couple of questions. Oh, right. Yeah. Neil Wilson asks, what right. kind of timer stopwatch do you have in your studio? I'm trying to find something digital as opposed to a handheld stopwatch, i.e. something you'd see in a professional recording studio. Mm -hmm. It's called your iPhone. Uh, or... Or your, your Samsung, Android. Or your Android, yeah. Oh I, I, oh, I can do the lap time on this one. Anyway, there's 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 two schools of thoughts on this. Yeah. I mean, if if I get a script and I, you know, it says 30 seconds, I've been doing this since the Ford administration. I know what 30 seconds is. Mm -hmm. And I'll and I can read it and I can cut it down into that into that time frame. Um but if it's the copy's kind of long or the copy's kind of short. I will use, you know, my, my iPhone and, you know, t -t -t -t. all right, I've got a couple of seconds that way. Sometimes if you're doing tags or whatever, they'll say you have to get this in 2.8 seconds or something crazy like yeah, that. Yeah, it's like, could you shorten it just a little bit? Um, you know, but uh, yeah, one, two, three, yeah. But do you, do you hear the buttons clicking and then phone beeping when you? No, of course not. That's why these, these, these are make a, they're a natural timer. Right. In fact, <laughs> Bo Weaver <laughs> Um, in his studio, he has an old iPad whose job is to do that thing. Yeah. Literally nothing more, nothing more than a timer. It sits on his copy stand right there and he has the timer app and that's it running on it. Yeah. So if, if you have an old iPad laying around, an iPad one, Maxine, you've got an iPad one. If you've got an old iPad laying around, that can be a dedicated timer because it's silent and easy to read. Or you find an old Kodak darkroom timer. Oh, the big manual ones? Those are pretty quiet, aren't they? They, are, they don't make it any noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when it gets to the end, you could have it light up a light bulb or That's something. That's right, exactly. Yeah. You're done. All right. You could have a sign yeah. that when it hits the end, it goes, shut up! <laughs> oh, Darn. Got to gotta, gotta speed up the copy a little bit. Uh, Your has a timer built in, too. Yeah, all, yeah all, I mean, all the programs that's another that. thing. Yeah, if you're recording yourself... like. Your recording software has a timer built in. <laughs> like, and so it's another way to just record your script. You you can you can see the timer or a common thing with most DAWs like Twisted Wave, we do this all the time. Highlight what you just read, just highlight it and it'll show you the selection exactly. length. So right. it's another way to do it. Half second too long. Half second. There's a Delete. lot of ways to do it. Oh, I'm under 30 seconds. Fabulous. Yeah. Jack hey, Daniel has a up. question. Oh, Shut up. up. No, we got one more question. Uh <laughs> says, I have a from Jack who's actually here, but I'll read the question. Uh, he says, I have a Persona Central Station monitor controller in the studio, along with a lot of other stuff. <laughs> a few days ago, it started emitting a high-pitched whine from the box itself, uh -oh. not my cans or monitors. I can correct the issue by tapping on top of the box, but this is pretty unsatisfactory. It's new, so I can return it. But you think of, can you think of anything that might be causing this sound? Isn't that what they call microphonic? That's an old thing from the tube days. Yeah. If you tap a piece of gear and it makes... <laughs> makes a strange weird noise that's called microphonic i don't know if it's microphonic because there's no tubes in could there could be a grounding issue but could be all it sorts definitely sounds here's the thing about new gear like when it fails it usually fails when it's pretty new right. and a lot of stuff that's i don't think they burn in a lot of gear these days burn in is when you plug your equipment in it's powered on and it runs for a, a good period of time, yeah. <laughs> the better the gear, the more expensive it is, the longer it's usually burned in. Like at Grace Design, mm -hmm. I've been to their factory, um, Maxine and I have, they have a big rack where their gear is all lined up and it sits there and it burns in for days. Because anything's going to fail, it fails usually within the first, I don't know, few hours to a few days. So it um, it's, seems like a, maybe a power supply thing. I'm Power supply is the theme of the evening. Um, it could be power supply. It's hard to say, but um, that definitely has to get get swapped out, you know, unfortunately. All right. all right. That's more geekiness than you are all prepared to handle. Uh, so anyway, Phil Proctor is coming up. We're going to have a great conversation with him. And if you've got questions for him, throw them in the chat room. And Jack Daniel, question asker, owner of Big Studio. I was over at a studio the other day. It's 
gorgeous. Oh, nice. Nice apartment, but the studio it dominates. Well, before we go, yes. how do they find you for tech support since we're the dudes that know all this stuff? Well, you can find me at homevoiceoverstudio.com. Right on. And where can they find you? I am over at georgethetech.com. So if you want to hire me for just on-demand stuff or if you want to send me audio to process for you or just do a sound check, georgethetech.com. And I do the same. All right, Phil Proctor coming up. Don't go away. We'll be right back on Voice Over Body Shop. Are you confused about how to set up and maintain a professional quality voiceover studio? No wonder. The information out there is mostly mythology. This is the best microphone to use. You have to have a preamp. You need a soundproof booth. This software is the best. Your audio must be broadcast quality. Consult with someone who knows the truth. Someone who's been there, in the trenches, doing voiceover for over 30 years. Someone with unparalleled experience with voiceover studios, who's worked with hundreds of voice actors and designed hundreds of personal studios. He knows how to teach and cares about your success. In one of the harshest environments known to voiceover, your home. Dan Leonard, the home studio master. Separate myth from fact and get a handle on your personal voiceover studio. Contact the Home Studio Master at homevoiceoverstudio.com. Drop off a specimen of your dry audio for a free analysis. Yeah, hi, this is Carlos Alas Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching Voice Over Body Shop. Yep, this is VOBS, proven anybody can have a show these days. Hey guys, this is Tom, also known as the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants, and you want to fill your ear holes and your eye holes with Dan and George and the Audio Body Shop. Ah! Meow. Snails like it too. Hey everybody, Source Elements, one of our wonderful sponsors of the show. They're the creators of Source Connect, which is an incredible software package for connecting to you, you, your studio, to other studios around the world. It has become, rapidly become, the Definitely the standardized software now that studios are using as an alternative to ISDN. It's a standalone application. It doesn't run in a web browser. So it's really very much a proven system that is insulated from the whim of Google Chrome and whatever your web browser is so that you have a system you can really count on. And it's what the studios are using. It really is the big tool, uh, the big tool of choice in the broadcast post-production, and the rest of the world. It is really the one that is getting a lot of traction. I'm hearing more and more now, now that Source Connect is what people are being asked to use. So be ready with it. Don't be caught uh, unprepared. Be ready. Get a demo right now. Go to source-elements.com and get a 15-day free trial of Source Connect. Give it a shot so you can better understand and be prepared for that big gig when it comes down to you. We'll be right back here with Dan and Phil Proctor right after this. Yeah, hi, this is Carlos Ellis Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching Voice Over Body Shop. Yep, this is VOBS, proven anybody can have a show these days. Yeah, hi, this is Carlos. Yep, this is VOBS, proven anybody can have a show these days. All righty. Time for our guest. Phil Proctor is an internationally known actor, singer, writer, composer, director, and producer. His musical and linguistic gifts have taken him from Broadway, The Sound of Music, A Time for Singing, to cities across the U.S., Canada, France, and the former USSR. That was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Doc, yeah. <laughs> he's now best. He's also best known for his collaboration with the cult comedy group, the Fire Sign Theater. Theater. Yes, along with other members of the Fire Sign Theater, he has received dual Grammy nominations. The group was the Fries. focus of a Fries. seminar Fries. at the West Fries. Coast branch of the Museum of Television and Radio, and mm. they were listed as one of the 30 greatest <laughs> acts, acts of all, all time, time, time by time, Entertainment time, Magazine, time, time, time. a major publication. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Welcome, Phil Proctor, <laughs> Good back to, to Voice again. Over Body Good Shop. And of course, you can see that it's been such a long time since we, we were on, I was on the show. Right. I, I grew a beard. Wow. See? But, I, of course, I can't match your splendorial mustachio, so. Right. I can show you how to do it. All right. Good. A little wax, I there assume, we go. is in there. 
So, uh, what have you been up to? Oh you've, been, my gosh. you've been a busy boy. Oh my gosh. Well, for instance, uh, since I saw you last, besides, you know, where's where's my fortune cookie? Uh, I have written two other books uh, uh, featuring Procter and Bergman, Power, Life on the Edge in L.A., and uh, Americathon, the, the skits behind the screenplay. Ah. And these are both on Bear Manor Press. Um, we can talk about them later sure. if you want. But uh, these are these are things that I promised Peter we would finish after he passed on. So, see, Pete, I did it. Okay, there they are. Uh, and I just got back from the Here Now Festival. You were in Kansas in City. In Kansas City. Where, <coughs> is everything up to date? I had terrible. Yes, pretty much. Uh, and I had pretty uh, terrible uh, hay fever, yeah. which is why I'm a little scratchy voice here. But I understand the scratchy voice is good, except not in China. Is that right? Okay. So anyway, uh, and this this is a wonderful festival that actually started as uh, uh, a, a 1979 in uh, another part of, of uh, Missouri, and it was a, a, a voiceover festival for teaching all kinds of workshops and microphone technique, narration technique, animation techniques, you know, how to do copy and all right. that stuff. And it's still going on strong. And they had oh, about, I don't know, 200 people who came, and they were involved in all kinds of wonderful workshops and got an opportunity, many of them, to perform their own special radio and audio pieces. Uh, and we also had the, uh, I think it was the 25th year of the Mark Time Awards, which are awards that David Osman started and that is now an international competition with entries hundreds of entries from all over the world. And this year, one of the, the winners of the audio award was from South Africa. And he came to the event cool. and spoke to us with that strange African accent, mm. you know, which nobody can do properly. Mm. Nobody. Not, not me, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a wonderful, uh, a fun event for me. And I was honored uh, on a, a Friday at the Cinemark Theater where Sue Ziza, who's one of the founders and one of the driving forces behind the, the festival for so many years. I uh, honored my career in the Firesign Theater and as a, a voiceover artist in general, and we premiered the podcast yes. of my book, Where's, Where's My, my Fortune, Fortune Cookie? Which, by the way, is a great book. Thank you. I don't read books generally, but you know, you sent me this. I read this thing through. I said, this is a great read. You can't put it down. Good, and it's profusely illustrated. You're right. I Which can't, is probably why I, I was able to see it. it. I, down. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There. Okay. Uh, so... That was very thrilling, and they actually played live the podcast in the theater. Wow. So we got to hear it, and, and, and one of the things about this, and I, I, we'll talk a little bit about this yeah. in terms of narration, because it, it, it's being a member of the Firesign Theater, uh, the Beatles of comedy by, called by the Library of Congress, uh, I wanted to not just read my book, but I wanted to embellish it, just like this is illustrated with pictures, I wanted to do something with the sound, and Sue and uh, her husband David, uh, 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 David, her husband David, that's not for anybody know right now, uh, w wanted to help me with that, and so they added certain sound effects and music to the storytelling. I also had a chance to correct some of the mistakes in the book, okay? Because I don't, if you're a writer, you you copy you copy read everything over and over and over again, but eventually you just kind of give up. Say, I got to get this book out there, okay? Like there it is, and. And so there were some factual errors that I discovered when I was reading the book in this little studio in Brooklyn, where I, in about three and a half days I got to read the whole book as a audiobook, which will be released as in September. But we we cut it up into uh, digestible segments for the podcast, so which will be sort of yeah episodes, yeah, which will be uh, highlighted by Tom Kelly, who is another podcaster, younger voice. And he will tell you what's what's coming up, what you may have missed from the last episode, and where we'll be going in the episode to follow. So every Friday at podbean.com and various other places, you know how these things go. Right. Uh, they're, they're like roots. They travel out in other places. Mm -hmm. There'll be a new episode from the book, Where's My Fortune Cookie, available at amazon.com. But the main and most exciting thing, Yes. About if that's not enough. That's not enough. Wait, right? there's more. The most exciting thing about my being uh, uh, honored in Kansas City was the fact that we were able to announce that the Library of Congress purchased the archives of the Firesign Theater for half a million dollars. That's it? <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that enough? <laughs> I'm really thrilled and honored 
uh, you know, for that to have happened. Yeah. I mean, it was back in the early 70s, and a friend of mine dragged me over to his house. I, I, used, to, I used to be in my early 70s. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting there. Uh-huh. Uh, but I remember him saying, got to listen to these guys. And, you know, you know, who are the bozos on this bus? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. crush that dwarf, hand me a plot. Yeah, 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 great stuff. My favorite though was the fake Shakespeare. Ah, anything yeah. you want to. Yes, yes. Where my favorite quote is, "May you stand knee deep in cow phlegm." Oh yeah, <laughs> that was so much fun to write. What was? How did that come about? I, well, it actually started at the Renaissance Pleasure Fair, one of the very first Renaissance Pleasure Fairs, where also the Flying Caramazzo brothers started mm-hmm. to do their stuff, and uh, where we became lifelong friends. And uh, we performed it as Waiting for the Count of Monte Cristo or someone like, like him. him. Yeah. That was the <laughs> Ur material for this. It was a Sturm und Drang kind of melodrama. And it slowly evolved and grew into a more Shakespearean experience. And then we were hired by National Public Radio on a show called, what was it called? It was something. Airplay? No, I don't know. We were, we were hired to uh, write a, an hour-long version of it, with live music, with authentic old instruments from the uh, Shakespearean period, and we wrote a wraparound. I was Derek Escrow, uh, a director from Australia, and I was manning this particular radio piece. And, uh, and, and we had this whole backstory, which you can hear on the record, Everything You Know Is Wrong, which is still not everything you know is wrong. I mean, anything you want to. Right. right. Everything I know is wrong, right? <laughs> Everything I say is wrong, too. But anyway, uh, and, and I'm so glad you like it, because that's really also one of my favorites. We also published a book of, the, of, of, that, of the scripts, and it's, and it's annotated. The joke of the book is that it's extensively annotated. And we wrote all these crazy, funny footnotes, you know, like some Shakespeare editions are, because it's old language and everything. The book is probably... Seventy uh, percent footnotes, <laughs> right? thirty percent right? scripts. So, like a paragraph in the line. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, then, and then the history of that, you know. And and we we wrote a whole fo- false history about ye old Firesign Theater in London back in the day. You know, it's a very funny book. I, I the next time I see you, I'll, I'll gift you a copy oh, of it. Oh, thank you. All right, because you'll you'll enjoy that. But but the one thing that that Sue said to me uh, about Promoting the podcast is, we all know about, the, well, we know about the Firesign Theater, right. but a lot of people out there, I'm sure, do not know. Those not born at that it particular time. It was a four-man time. satirical comedy group that, that came together on Radio Free Oz, on KPFK, listener-supported L.A. radio, back in 1965 or so, and we, we got a contract uh, from Gary Usher at Columbia Records to do our first album, Waiting for the Electrician or Someone Like Him. And yes, and, uh, and we still are, by the way. And, uh, and from that, uh, a fellow named John McClure, who was working in the Spoken Arts Division at Columbia, said, we've got to sign these guys for multiple albums. And here's the trick. In exchange for a reduced royalty, which I'm sure we could all use in this country right now, a reduced royalty. We don't need a monarch. <laughs> in, in exchange for reduced monarch, they gave us unlimited studio time. Okay? So we could spend hours in the studio right. creating our multi-layered records. Right. And you asked me also about the, the performance the process. technique. How, right. did, How did, did you process? guys do this? I don't write a lot about it in the book, yeah. actually. I, I, I mention it. And the reason that I didn't get into the weeds with the Firesign Theater is because... We were together for 50 years, and uh, through divorces and suicides and all kinds of, of strange pairings, you know, uh, and, and naturally, like any great band, there are going to be breakups and things, but we couldn't replace our drummer. You know, it was, just, <laughs> it was just the four of us, always just the four of us. And we had this magic together, and we made this magical comedy music together, and, and, we, and what kept us together was love. Love. But uh, Dave Osman, for instance, wrote a book, which I also should have brought you a, a copy to look at, at Bear Manor Press, called Fighting Clowns of Hollywood. And those are his observations and notes when we were doing a, a, a record uh, called uh, The Fighting Clowns, with artwork by the late, great Phil Hartman, by the way. Oh, wow. And it was a live musical album that we did at the Roxy. 
and recorded, you know, with a big old truck. <laughs> In those days, you had to have a big old truck. Oh, yeah. You know, now, you know, you can have this little thing here. Oh, yeah, you know, just, you know stick it in your ear. And, you got, and, and, uh, and anyway, uh, that, that is, uh, it became an amazing album. But David shows the warts and all because, you know, he, he, he extricates me or whatever that word is. He, 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 uh, uh, he, he's mad at me at one point, you know, for, for something that I didn't want to do. And he's mad at Phil at another point, And he's mad at Peter at another point, And we're all mad at him, you know. And, but, but it shows the process. We got through it and we did it. And here's the funny thing about writing with three other guys. So all this stuff was written. It was, yes, it, it was, it was all written. totally scripted. Oh, my God. And wow. that was always the hardest part. Yeah. Okay? <clears throat> because there were four guys, four strong egos, four fire signs. I'm a Leo. There were two Sagittarians. And unfortunately, Phil Austin is an Aries. Okay? <laughs> so, you know, stubborn mule, I mean, ram, you know. So, so we, we, we constantly, the writing process was arduous which is why we smoked a lot of marijuana and drank a lot of brandy. El Presidente. We, we would drink brandy. And I would make model, models out of paper, castles and things. Well, you know, I'm telling you. But, but, the, but we would eventually come up with some material, and then we could go into the studio, and we could lay it down, and we could see what it sounded like, and that would inform us as to the next you know, process of writing the next stage of the story. I, I got to butt in on the studio sure. part. You did the remotes, but when, when you had that unlimited studio time to play around, when you were getting that time, was that on a four-track studio? Oh, man. How many oh, tracks did you have to We, we started at Columbia Records, at Columbia Square, recording in radio studios. Okay, mm. so just half-inch. Classic, great inch. radio studio. Yeah. And, and the, the biggest studio, which had an audience, uh, 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 bleachers, was where I think Bob Hope did his stuff, and you know who knows who else. But but uh, we were in this this magical space and doing this this incredibly complicated work. And yes, indeed, George, when we started, it was maybe an eight track, mm -hmm. you know, and we'd have to we luxury. You got yeah, eight tracks yeah, well, back then, you know. Hey, Man. big time, <laughs> Columbia yeah. Records, you know, and and we would f rapidly fill up the tracks. Uh, or Philip would fill up the tracks, or Phil Austin would, <laughs> and and then we'd we'd run we'd we'd have something else we wanted to overdub, uber dubbing over uh, artists, yeah. And so they do a thing called ping pong, right? Where you, you throw up <laughs> throw all the tracks into one yeah. track, mix them, and then you you free up the other tracks, and you can lay some of this. Now stuff we in. call it freezing them, basically. They're, freezing them. Once that's done, it's done. You know, it's that's okay. It. You commit. Yeah, you as you commit, or you committed. <laughs> yeah. uh, and 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 as we continued to work. And once we broke out of Columbia and started using other studios, Warner Brothers, we recorded at at one point, and RCA at another point, uh, the tracks, the, the tapes got bigger and bigger and bigger <laughs> until we have a picture of us with these huge reels of tape with big, thick, like pasta tape, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then it all went away. Yeah. It became digital. <laughs> okay. Right, right, right. And it was gone. Yeah. And and the studio became the little box like the thing you were holding in your hands. And and that allowed us to do a different kind of location recording. We used contact microphones. We set up uh, a little like almost a, a movie studio like scenes where we could walk from one part of the studio into another to create a certain verisimilitude. Oh. But to get back to the writing process. Yes. Yes. What we learned was when we went in with our arduously created scripts and started playing the roles we started changing things and if you look at those early scripts which will be in the library of congress now if you want to look at them next time you're in washington every every single one of us or the four of us has scripts that, you, that had like hieroglyphics you know little mm -hmm. notes and things and eventually we we since we do take after take after take we almost throw them away and improvise on the premise because oh. we'd gotten to know the characters right. and we knew what the material was. We knew what we were trying to, to do and new jokes would suddenly appear and the interaction, you know, fed us because the joy of fire sign theater, which has never been replicated was that we were our writers, our producers, our musicians, our actors all wrapped up together 
in one crazy unit of four crazy guys. Yeah. And we called ourselves the four or five crazy guys because the fifth guy was the result of the interaction of all of us <laughs> yeah. where we, we kind of lost ego. We lost right. ownership of right. what it was that we, that we wrote. It took we on created. a life of its own. It took on a life yeah. of its own, and it became more than the sum of its parts. Fascinating. Hey, if you're just joining us, you've already missed a whole lot. Uh, we're talking. Can't you play it back? <laughs> that's, the great, that's the great thing about if you listen to it on a podcast, you can do that. That's right. Or watch the replay tomorrow. Um, and if you're hearing me say this, why are you? Why do you care? Uh, <laughs> Phil Proctor's our guest. If you've got a question for him, throw it in the chat room. And Jack Daniel, who's been sitting here patiently, drinking. Uh, yes, supposedly, and he'll be uh, relaying those questions to us. And I'm sure. Lots of you out there remember Fireside Theater or have a question about some of the stuff we're going to talk George, about. And George, and, and Dan, if you yes. don't, hi George, yeah. if you don't remember Fireside Theater, yeah. I'm the voice of Howard on the Rugrats. Where's Phil and Lil? Okay. <laughs> I'm also the, uh, uh, the, 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 the seahorse father in Finding Nemo. You're a clownfish, say something funny. I'm also in the game Assassin's Creed. The villain, Dr. Warren Vidic. Oh. See? <laughs> Aspergo wants you. And the drunken French monkey in the Dr. Doolittle movies. Oh, I, oh, I remember that. Yeah. yeah, I did five of those. Oh. That was a wonderful thing. And, oh yes, uh, Charlie, the, uh, the, the, this monster's manager in Monsters Monster Incorporated. Yeah. Okay, I called in the, the squad, you know. Yeah. And finally, at least uh, these pictures that I have, I played the chef in the Academy Award winning anime, Spirited Away, oh, which if wow. you haven't seen it, isn't it a beautiful, beautiful movie, yeah. mystical and, and magical. Yep. So uh, I, have, I have had this other bizarre career, which also involves movies and television, all kinds of stuff. It's, it's in the book. It's in the book. Amazon.com or the podcast on Podbean. Dot com. Every Friday you'll hear a little, another little mystery about, oh, there I am with Bob Cummings. Who they probably, probably don't know either, right? Uh, and oh, here I am on uh, All in the Family with Archie Bunker. Oh, goodness! Okay, <laughs> yeah. So I, I had I've had an amazingly wonderful career, si about sixty five years in show business. Yeah, because I started as a little kid, along with Elliot Gould, on a live radio show, <laughs> television show, in uh, in New York called Uncle Danny Reads the Funnies, oh my where God. basically it was at the uh, New York at the uh, Daily News building uh, on WPIX TV, and Danny Leonard, I think his last name was, would maybe, maybe it's you. I don't, uh, it's your relative. It's your long lost. There's, there's uncle. a number of famous Dan Leonard. Long radio lost. Radio. Uncle, right. Anyway, he would read the comics, and they'd show the comic strip, Dick Tracy or Little Orphan Annie or what have you, and then I and another uh, pretty little girl would comment and improvise on you know what was going on. And Elliot Gould was also one of these guys who did this at the Very time. Cool. <laughs> Funny thing to have in common with him, you know. Yeah. Now you you were you you were in your your wonderful newsletter, which I love reading. Oh, thank you. And, you know, Planet I, Proctor. Yes, it's fabulous stuff. I thank get it, you. and I'm like, oh, it's hilarious. Oh. <laughs> but you've also we've you've, we've also lost a lot of people in the last few months. Oh gosh, yes. one of them was Harry Anderson, who you yeah. knew fairly well. Tell us about thank Harry you. Anderson. Well, Harry, when when Proctor and Bergman these these two guys were, were touring in our touring years. Um, we ran across a guy in uh, Austin, Texas, uh, who was a magician. He was working as a, a bartender and doing wonderful magic. And we needed an opening act. So we said, okay, because the guy who was going to open for us in Austin was going to do a Lenny Bruce set. And I said, no, 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 we can't, you can't do Lenny Bruce before... Proctor and Bergman, it's just too wrenching. So we, uh, we, we, we said, Harry, do you think you could do some magic to open for us? Sure. And he wowed them. He did his, his needle through the arm routine, and he was brilliant. And so we ran into him again in Houston, and we did the same thing. We said, we, our act is entirely different now. It's more like a new age act. Could, could you do something like that? He showed up in like a... a, 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 a a, a dashiki, some kind of a transparent cloaky thing with lights underneath it, lighting, you know. Looked like a Peter Max poster. Yeah, like, it was amazing. <laughs> and he did this psychedelic set that was just... So afterwards, <clears throat> over uh, uh, dinner, 
we said, you know, you, you really got great stuff, Harry. You should come to Hollywood. And the next thing I know, well, maybe seven years later, I'm guest starring on his show on the Night, Night Court. Court three times. Wow. And then later on Dave's World. And Harry had this phenomenal success, but retained his sweetness, his openness, his friendship. And he, he, would, he would go out of his way to make sure that he was always connected with all of his friends. He'd call us out of the blue, always inappropriately. For, for instance, <laughs> when, when uh, Siegfried and Roy had that terrible accident where the tiger attacked Roy, he called up and he said, pardon me, Roy. Was that the cat that ate your face off? Oh, and then he'd say, too soon, and hang up. <clears throat> you know, and I call him back and oh, we talk, talk, talk. Uh, and, and the latest one, the last one before he passed away, of complications of the flu when he had a stroke in the hospital. Oh, God, I'm not talking about that. I just did talk about that, but I want to tell you about the last time I saw him. The last time he called, it was this. Don't know why I've got lipstick on my fly. Stormy Daniels. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Never too soon. So my, my wife, Melinda, and I, uh, when we... Uh, Dave Osman <clears throat> and I have created a piece called The Art of Radio. And it looks like we're going to be doing uh, some performances of this here in Los Angeles. And I'll let you guys know, let you all know, you can come as our guests. And <clears throat> we premiered it at the Library of Congress uh, at a wonderful theater called the Coolidge Theater. And after that, <clears throat> we were in the, the D.C. area, Washington, D.C. Harry lives in, uh, lived in Asheville. North Carolina. We have many friends in Asheville. Gorgeous place. Yeah, great place. A lot of voiceover people there, actually. Yes, so yeah. I've heard. Yeah. So, and so we drove and spent three days at Harry's new house, because he had an, a, another house we used to visit, <clears throat> with his two new dogs and his beautiful wife, Elizabeth. And his, this house is like a big old gothic place, you know, and absolutely crammed to, uh, with his with his magic uh, uh, paraphernalia. You know, he, he even he had like an outbuilding filled with paraphernalia that he just sold to somebody, and then another outbuilding which which had posters and all oh, and all kinds of of uh, other scripts and crazy things. And we stayed in the Jay Johnson suite. Jay Johnson has been a long time. You can call colonist. me Ray. You can call me Jay. That guy. No, Jay I'm Johnson is the the, pup, the uh, ventriloquist, very famous ventriloquist, oh, okay. who was on Soap. That's ah, yes, his, yes, okay? yes, yes, yes. And Jay actually was the 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 host at the Magic Castle Memorial uh, two weeks ago. Heartbreaking and wonderful and fun and yeah. funny. And uh, anyway, Harry has the Jay Johnson suite because he had been doing some theater with Jay locally and in, and in the North Carolina area. And they were going to mount a production of a play uh, called J.B., uh, which is a poetical play. And our friend John Apicella made Mask, a mask of the devil and a mask of God. It's a very strange play about these two, a car, two guys in a carny who decide to become God and the devil to tell the story of Job. And, and Harry was really ready to do it until he got sick. But uh, in, this, in this house of his, I asked him, I said, did you move your electric chair from the old house to this one? He said, oh, yeah, and I bought another one. <laughs> now, how many people do you know who have two electric chairs in their house? That's an interesting collection. Well, one yeah. of them is for the guests. Oh, okay. You know. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And, and he said an absolutely wonderful thing quite early in his career. He said a wonderful thing about radio. He said, radio is like magic. It has to be believed to be seen. Mm. Interesting. Isn't that beautiful? That's that is well said. Anyway, we miss him greatly. Uh, he had three memorials, one at the Sportsman's Lodge where he used to stay when he was filming his show. The second one uh, was at the Magic Castle. And last, we, uh, last Sunday uh, in New Orleans, at, uh, at, they had another memorial for him. Yeah. A, a, a great talent. God rest in peace. Yeah. Our guest is Phil Proctor here on Voice Over Body Shop. Again, if you got a question, throw it in the chat room. We'll be right back with a little bit more with Phil Proctor, so stay right where you are. Style. 
power. You're watching the home of the NFL. The all-new iPhone. Reserve your Disney World season pass now. Through all the runny noses, three in the morning coughs. An all-new American crime story, tonight on FX. This week only, it's Pasta Fest at Olive Garden. Heart rate, prime. Blood pressure, perfect. I grew up with the classics, and now with StubHub, I can get authentic tickets to the best shows. The all-new Chevy Cruze from $16,995. Be inspired, then get the beauty that's uniquely yours at Sephora. This week at Home Depot, it's our Garden Fest sale with up to 30% off all garden tools, sod, and seeds. Hi, it's J. Michael Collins, and these are just a few examples of the first-class demos my team and I are producing. If you'd like to have something similar, visit jmcvoiceover.com and click on the Demo Production tab to find out more. All right, time to talk about VoiceOver Essentials. It's their VO accessory sale extended for one more week due to popular demand from ABS straps. What? You got to throw me the ABS strap. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Which, that looks dirty. It is. <laughs> it will save your microphone from a potentially fatal fall. To headphone hangers, to their VoiceOver recording LED sign with remote. Which is right here. Wow. There it is. Oh my gosh. If I only plugged it in, then we'd really have something. But there you can see it says voiceover recording. Yes. It's on sale. And here's the thing. If you you it, <laughs> the savings yes, get yes. larger, the more you buy. Oh. One more week, and that's it. Click on the on sale menu item on voiceoveressentials.com for full details. Get a minimum of 10% off on any accessory purchase. Buy $50 or more of accessories and get 12% off. Buy $100 or more of accessory items and get a full 15% off. And that discount applies to select accessory items only. Like their VO1A pop wrap around pop filter, headphone <laughs> hanger, adjustable desktop stand, the ABS boom strap. <laughs> there it is! Hey! The boom jock. I've been Tie wanting to get this up. Tie I have been up. searching all over for the place the place for this. I found it this afternoon. And there it is. All righty. Yeah. Hi there. And their mo wildly popular multicolored LED voiceover recording sign <laughs> with remote. Check on sale menu item for full voiceover details at voiceoveressentials.com. And there it is. All righty. We'll be right back. Yeah, hi, this is Carlos Ellis Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching Voice Over Body Shop. Yeah. Now, what's yep, the name this of this company? This is VOBS. Proven anybody can show these it's Tarlin Hogan's exactly. question. Hey guys, this is Tom, also known as the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants, and you want to fill your ear holes and your eye holes with Dan and George and the Audio Body Shop. Ah! Mow! Snails like it too. All right, we're back here on Voice. I wanted to show. ask you about yes. this wonderful yes. deal yes. at VoiceOver Essentials. <laughs> yeah. uh, can, can I get a, a discount for? Because this is all I I have right now. So uh, the, the shrinking doll. Well, right? it's already a little discounted. <laughs> okay. But, uh, <laughs> Harry Anderson gave me this. Wow. He made it for me. He made it for me. You you can make it yourself. That's, this is a real dollar bill. I've been carrying it around so long it's falling apart. But uh, there's a secret way to do this. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't bones. tell you, because I am a life member so of the Magic Castle. Yes. We want to talk a little <laughs> bit about narration technique. Yes. Because uh, narration is what I think most, you know, a lot of our audience is like, they narrate stuff. That's it's, right. It's, it's e-learning, it's audiobooks, it's all sorts of stuff. There are like thousands of audiobooks that are now coming out. Everything since Gutenberg they want recorded. <laughs> it's just about. Right. That's yeah. right. What's the key to good narration in your mind? Well, <sighs> inhabiting the material. <clears throat> honoring the material. It's the same thing that, that makes theater exciting. You have to honor the author. And uh, the narrators that I, whose work I most admire are ones who can bring dramatic reality to the characters without going crazy about it. But just, it's very subtle. But uh, uh, they can bring a reality when characters are talking to one another and they can bring a, 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 a sense of mystery really to everything that they're doing so that <clears throat> you can you do not always anticipate what's going to happen next mm -hmm. and uh, the the one thing about narration that bothers me 
personally. And the reason why I did uh, the the uh, recording of Where's My Fortune Cookie <laughs> in the podcast, which you can listen to on podbean.com, uh, I wanted to make it as, as illustrated as the book itself is with pictures. And I figured that the best way to do that was with character and sound, sound effects, and music, which you're not really allowed to do. I was going to say, but that's the way audiobooks should be. Yeah, they should be. But, but most of the audio producers simply want to keep it, there. it's talk about budget, right? Yeah. They want to keep it simple, read the book. But here's a funny thing that happened to me. <clears throat> My wife, Melinda Peterson, who appeared uh, in, in several plays with me at the uh, Here Now Audio Festival in Kansas City, uh, she's sitting uh, in the audience of my uh, uh, honorific on Friday afternoon where we're going to going to premiere the podcast. And so the podcast is premiered. Now in the podcast I read the forward which is called I think forward into the past and and I thank in the forward, you know, my daughter Kristen and various other people, but I don't thank my wife because I dedicated the book to her. And it says right here, well this book is dedicated to my darling wife, Melinda. And there. guess what wasn't part of the recording Oops. when they played it? Oops. And why wasn't it? Oh, no. Because audiobooks don't read the dedications. Oh, oh, my gosh. All right. Now, my mother suffered from macular degeneration, which I also have, the dry form, so it's slow. Uh, there's no cure for it. But it's slow, so maybe there will be if I can, you know, see it happening. <clears throat> and uh, and she used to listen to books. They weren't on tape; they were on disc. Books for the blind. Right. And uh, and everything is read when you read a book for the blind, right. including you know all the stuff about the the what library number it is, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. Right. Copyright. Blah 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 blah. So I was shocked when I learned that they don't read the dedication. You know, it, that's just an arbitrary decision. It takes up, how much time does it take to read a dedication? You know, <clears throat> so I have certain problems with, I mean, that's a minor quibble, but you understand what I'm saying. I know. And, and, and I actually met some people at the Here Now Festival in Kansas City who worked out of their own studio in a very inventive way. They created this one fellow in particular, uh, a, a, Dan Hayes, I think his name is. He created different voices, really distinct character voices for each of his characters. A little bit like Harry Shearer mm -hmm. does in his radio show, yeah. Le Show, and mm -hmm. overdubbed himself and produced it with music and sound effects and filter effects if they're on the phone and everything. And I was blown away. And, and he has done this because he was uh, started as a narrator and he got bored with it. And he said, what can I do to expand the art and give me control, like the Fireside Theater? So he produced, he figured out a way to produce himself in his studio there in Kansas City. And he found clients who want a more dramatic, interesting, involving... Oh, that's great to hear. ...illustrated that's the way story, I it, right? Too. That's why I stopped doing audiobooks. This is... It Just takes reading. a lot of time, yeah. and it's you know, it, I I do recommend it for people who want to get into the voiceover industry because it will teach you discipline. It'll teach you a oh, lot yeah. <laughs> about how to bring a story to life, which will help you in any other form that you're asked to do: radio commercials, cartoons, what have you. Uh, it, the, the I think the 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 secret to transitioning from narration to these other forms is the art of exaggeration, okay? Because you're allowed to exaggerate in, in the world of audio. <clears throat> has to be believed to be seen. And, <clears throat> and, 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 but in narration, it can become distracting because people are listening to it while they're driving or they're jogging or doing other things we can't talk about on the radio. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it requires a certain kind, as you say, of kind of boring approach to it. Right. And you bring as many colors to that as you can, and that's why some of these narrators are are, are better known than others. In listening <clears throat> at the awards ceremony, audiophile awards for uh, in various categories uh, at the Here Now Festival on Saturday night, I <laughs> remember they'd play snippets from these various things, and this is what I remember: mystery. He walked into the room. It was dark. The candle 
suddenly sputtered out. I turned and I saw... It fades out. Comedy. I don't know what was so funny about it. I was wearing a skirt. So what? <laughs> I'm a kind of a colorful guy. And then she said to me... Fades out. A cult... A, not a cult. Dragon stories. The dragon was fiery. And he had a coppery hue to his scales. He turned... And his great claws rose. I even, you know, they're like they're all, they're all the, all the same, all, all the same kind of, kind of thing, but with you know, different little colors to them, you know. And, and and I found it amusing that there was such a sameness to all of it, you know. Interesting. We've got lots of audience questions. Okay. People. Oh, that's great. Yes. So why don't we get into some of those? Uh, Let's get into the weeds. Yes. Yeah. One from. By the way, you got any weed? <laughs> There's some over there. All right. Here, I'm here. All right. All righty. Uh, Jack. This is legal uh, anywhere. Yeah, I know in California. Oh, man. Uh, that's over there. All right. Okay. Yes, wait, let's hand Jack Daniel the oh. microphone. Oh. He gets to ask his own question. Oh. Wow. Phil. Yeah. Hi. What do you think of the effect of comedy on comedy of today's hyper politically correct atmosphere compared with the freedom you might have had when you were doing fire sign in its day? Yeah. Meeting? It's it's definitely chilling. Um, a lot of, of very well known comedians, as you probably heard, are unwilling to go on the road because they they feel that the the PC movement, which comes from the left and the right, by the way, it's a pincher squeeze, uh, it has taken the fun out of satire and parody, which by its very nature has to uh, express in, in, in a funny form, like a, like a jester, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the ruder things, to say ruder things. Like George Carlin was the, the greatest, crudest, most wonderful jester in, in the world. And, and, and I think that basically comedy now is expressly uh, the late night shows and the other cable shows, which the, which daily the Daily Show and and the Colbert Report started, that Colbert, for instance, is he's merciless in his monologues. Absolutely, I, I love his monologues, and and it's very important that these jesters can still speak to the nation, because you know if you can't laugh about some of this stuff, you're going to cry, you know, and if you laugh hard enough. You'll you cry anyway. That's true. All right, so that's kind of my take on it. Anyway. All right. Next question from All Divox. Right. This one's from Divox, who watches you guys, or watches us, actually. You guys. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> watch you guys. He's watching us from Japan. Oh, um, arigato. Apart from the weed and the brandy, any techniques <laughs> or tricks that you discover that make your writing or recording sessions just go better for you, more efficient and, or more creative? Yeah. We started on the radio. Four guys improvising together on the radio. And we soon, and we, we did shows like the Fireside Theater, Hour Hour. We did two hours of comedy together, you know, broken by records and uh, interrupted by records. And a guy named the, 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 uh, the, the real Earl Jive, who was our engineer, who used to sometimes drop in sound effects in the middle of one of our improvs. So we had to respond to that. But we learned quickly that we had to bring in material of our own. Because there was a place for it, you know? Mm. So we would all write stuff and bring it in. And that is what added to the mix. Because what we would bring in, sometimes it was written for the other guys to, you know, to play kind of on the spot without any rehearsal. Here, there's your part and this part. And let, now let's do it. <clears throat> and Earl, you can you know, put in sound effects or whatever. And other times they'd be individual bits that each one of us would come up with. And that would inspire our writing for the for the the uh, the records and the other thing that we did and i don't know how easy this is for other people to do but we perform our material on the stage before we put it down in the studio we used to go to a place called the ash grove which by the way was burned down twice the ash grove and <laughs> and it's now the improv and has been the improv for for ages. And it hasn't burned down since. It hasn't burned down. <laughs> hey, burned down the house with funny comedy, you know. But uh, we we would bring pieces in like "Don't Crush That Dwarf, Hand Me the Pliers," which is uh, which uh, is about channel surfing. Right. We predicted channel surfing. 
Uh, we did it as a, a stage play with masks and things to make quick changes. And it was called A Life in the Day. Uh, okay? And, and it morphed because the audience told us what was working, what wasn't working, where the jokes were. And after, you know, doing it for a weekend or something, we could go back into our <clears throat> writing sessions you know, with, with, with renewed vigor uh, as to the arc of the story and the development of the characters. Now, you, I do this myself when I'm reading for something. Uh, I will improvise myself with the character. Uh, I'll, I'll, before I lay it down on, on, uh, uh, as an audition for my own home studio, I will play with it. And you were asking me earlier, uh, before we started talking together, about uh, how to enliven copy, right. okay, especially comedic copy. <clears throat> One of the ways to do that is, if you get a piece of straight copy, read it with an accent. See what it sounds like if you read it as a German, or perhaps you are French, you know, or a Spanish, or maybe a Russian. You know, what is it, colors do you bring to this? How does it change what you are doing? Or read as a cartoon character, <laughs> and then read it straight. And you'll find that you will be imbued, the copy will be imbued with different colors because of what your brain has just discovered by playing with it. You know, improv, improv is impish behavior, and it's, and it's in, one, in a certain way improving what you're doing, you know? Uh, absolutely. There's a golden nugget for you right there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, with Secret Sauce. That's true. We have uh, another question from Maxine. Right here in the audience. Hey, Maxine. She can pick up the microphone, microphone and ask the actual question. The beautiful Maxine. Okay. Um, so, hi. I, I love everything that you're sharing, um, but I'm always interested in uh, the person behind the amazing, accomplished, wonderful, beautiful, fantastic voice actor. And I'm just curious what you do um, in other parts of your life, like what do you do with your discretionary time? Like, do you play what discretionary golf or do you, time? Or do you like what? What other things do you do in your life besides voiceovers? Right. Photography. Mm. Oh, do you? I, uh, yeah. Oh, how I, interesting. If you That's visit wonderful. my uh, website, first of all, you can you can uh, connect with Planet Proctor at planetproctor.com, which I've done. Okay, <laughs> and it's it's Proctor? a free yeah, it's a free Proctor. blog, and it's beautifully illustrated by my friend uh, Chris. Uh, Chris Gross up in uh, uh, Lake Arrowhead, and uh, and I love writing it, and I love seeing what he does with the stuff I've I've written, how he lays it out, and everything. Uh, and that and that's a hobby too, that I that I've been doing for like twenty years, writing this this crazy blog, oh. uh, which which get, basically comes from the internet. But my both of my uncles were professional photographers back in Goshen, Indiana, okay. and so as a kid, I worked down in the in the the dark room, you know, uh, with the chemicals. And making pictures on a Kodak know, timer, and a, oh, <laughs> and a Kodak timer. Yeah, I identified with that immediately, and and so I, I I learned at an early age how to see things through a lens and how to capture them. And I to this day I love doing it. I took a picture today, which I posted on my my uh, Facebook, of of some palm trees and the shadow that they were casting on this stark white building, and I, I see as long as I still can see. <laughs> with with my you know no macular degeneration it hasn't ruined my eyes completely yet i i see things all the time around me and i want to capture them uh, i'm also married to uh, melinda peterson who is a wonderful actress we just celebrated 26 years of marriage and this is my my third and last my <laughs> final, as she calls him, I'm his final wife, okay? And, and that takes up a lot of time. Our marriage is, is important. We love to travel together. We're going to be going to a mini high school reunion with a friend of mine in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a guy named Jimmy Merrill, who's now a professor emeritus of art. But when we were at Riverdale Country School in the Bronx, in the dorm together, he was the one who introduced us all to rock and roll. Huh. He used to turn, during breaks in our study uh, hours, he would turn his, crank his radio up on a rock and roll station and go, where's rock and roll? And we're all going, wow, 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 wow. And, 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 and later, he became an expert in illuminated manuscripts and was flown all over the world to, to go to various 
uh, mansions and estates all, you know, in France and Germany and everywhere. And, and to, they would bring out their illuminated Bibles, their family Bibles. Illuminated is the, the monks would use gold and, and fancy lettering, right? All of that. He became a, an expert in this. And it, he ended up now at Cambridge University. And after that, we're going to take the, uh, the Thistle train, the Thistle Express, up to Edinburgh. And we're going to rent a car. And we're going <laughs> to drive the old whiskey trail. Oh, I've known Aye. a few people that have done that. And that's, yeah, yeah, we're going to get malted <laughs> yes. and scotched, you know. And then we're, we're driving back down to Edinburgh, and we're going to be at the, at the Fringe Festival uh, uh, oh once, once again for yes. another year and seeing all our friends who are doing plays and things. That are Outstanding. And we're going to see the tattoo at the castle. Oh. The tattoo is this incredible <laughs> military, <laughs> yeah, thing, bagpipes <laughs> galore and drums and everything, you know, military precision, and it takes place at night. In the castle, and can't wait to see more. <laughs> George, you have the last question. Uh, yeah, um, if Fireside Theater was launching now, let's say, let's just let's time shift. Take the four of you, and now it's 2013 or something. Um, do you think you would have been shooting to be like a Netflix series or yeah. a YouTube channel, or do you think you would have just stuck with an yeah, audio no, format? No, we. The one real tragic thing that happened uh, to Fireside, and it, it's in the book. Uh, was that we had a producer named Wacko. Jerry Bryant was his name. And we were writing a Firesign Theater movie. You know, the Kentucky Fried movie came out. Mm, sure. Airplane was a big hit yeah. with, uh, with the poster done by Bob Grossman, who just passed away, oh, who did yeah. the Don't Crush That Dwarf, Hand Me the Pliers, yep. who was Peter posters. Bergman's roommate at Yale. You know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and anyway, what was I saying? Uh, <laughs> You, would you have done done oh, yeah, for, yeah, we, for we pictures? Done, yeah, 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 yeah. We were going to make a movie, a Fireside yeah. Theater movie. Yeah, yeah. And it was going to be called Eat. And it started with the Fireside Theater Presents, like a, a, a sign. And, the, and, and all of the bulbs started going out right. until you just saw Eat. Yeah. And it was flashing. <laughs> and we move in, and it was a diner. Yeah. And that was the beginning of the adventure. He drowned in Hawaii. Oh, oh. oh my god. He drowned gosh. in Hawaii. And, and nobody happened. else came forward in his place, because I think we could have had a film career, you know? Uh, and so we uh, focused exclusively on the recording thing. But we did be these big tours yeah. with costumes and props and yeah. special effects, you know? Sure. So we, we, we did bring a certain visual excitement and engagement to our audiences. Yeah. But uh, we did one cable special called Weirdly Cool for PBS, and you know, you know, we're just going to say, wait, I know you've done one. Yeah, I gotta find yeah. that. I gotta but, find that. But but uh, it it really wasn't that satisfying mm -hmm. because you know it it's a different art. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a different art. And Procter and Bergman, we did a special also for PBS, which I think was a little more successful. The world of Procter and Bergman with various skits and things that we that they brought to life. But it's a different medium. Yeah. And yeah. and I think that the fire sign, you know, still should be best known for our audio creations. Yeah. And for the power of the movies in your mind. Yeah. And that's the way I remember it. And they're, and they're still deeply ingrained <laughs> in there. So I appreciate it. Phil, thanks so much for coming Always on our fun. show again. Thank nice you so much. Nice to see you again. All righty. We'll be right back to wrap things up right after this. Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services, while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. And we are back to say goodbye. 
Yes, Hello, are. I must be going. I came to see. I cannot stay. I must be going. I'm glad I came up just the same. I must be going. You're such a song and dance man. I know. Da, 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 da. <laughs> anyway, um, next week on this very show, Dave Cavassier is coming all the way from Las Vegas. He's going to be actually here? He's heading down 15, going through the Cajon That's Pass, awesome. down the 210, <laughs> onto the, awesome. the 134, onto the 101. I've become such a Californian, and, and he will be joining us here live in the studio. We'll talk about his career. You better drive your SSR. Yeah. Because that car belongs here. In, yeah, it really LA. does. <laughs> That's going to be a lot of fun. We're looking forward to having Dave here. Uh, who are our donors of the week? I went through and found a bunch of names, and pretty much all of these we know, which is great. Um, Tracy H. Reynolds, Eric Aragoni, Philip Sapir, Sarah Borges, Uncle Roy Okelson, Brian Rausch, Graham Spicer, Andrew Kaufman, Jack DeGolia, Joseph Harrison, Christy Burns, and Cam Cornelius, the voiceover dude. Dude, I got his T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, me my too. favorite black T-shirt. Yeah. Steve Nashen is retiring. Yeah. Did, did you ever meet Steve? I've not met him, but you've told me all Maybe about him. Maybe this is an opportunity to meet. You should crash. Come down. DG Entertainment. I'll okay. get you the information. Please. We're at, there's going to be a party for him. I shouldn't say we. I've been invited by oh, okay. Steve, but there's a little party for him. He's going to be retiring, and Steve Nafshin is special to me because he is the fellow who introduced me to Don LaFontaine. Yeah. And uh, he was an engineer at Wood Holly and now DG Entertainment for many years, and all the top brass voice actors walked through, came into Steve's studio, including Don. So if it wasn't for Steve, I would never have met Don. Thank you, Steve. And... Uh, you know, congratulations on retirement. He's moving off to Hawaii. <laughs> Gee, that sucks. You know, Unless, of course, he lives in Leilani Estates. But... <laughs> no, he's in, <laughs> he's going to be in Kauai. Where oh, okay. where, yeah, where, much where, nicer. But uh, it's congratulations, Steve. Thank yes. you, man. All righty. You know, George and I fix your home studios. We plan your home studios. We design your home studios. Even if it's in your closet, we know how to make it happen for you. So if you want to work with George, who's fabulous at this, where do they go? You can stumble on over to georgethetech.com, and then if you like a different flavor, head over to homevoiceoverstudio.com, <laughs> and uh, we both will listen to your audio samples, and uh, we'll tell you if it's working or not. Mm -hmm. Getting a lot of those lately. Get you dialed. Yes, and you've got a podcast. Yep, that geeky one we do, the Pro Audio Suite. Um, I've got a bunch of great co-hosts on that, Andrew Peters and Darren Robertson from Australia. And Source Elements' own Robert Marshall. Excellent. The four of us get to geek out. And then there's some great interviews with some pretty well-known voice actors and musicians. So it's oh, a great show. Got to tune in for that one. Uh, we need to thank, of course, uh, uh, Jack DeGolia for doing the show notes. The show notes are fabulous when you watch the show uh, in repeat on uh, YouTube or on Facebook. It's Note for note. Yeah, they are time stamped, too. Yeah, like, if you fabulous. see something you read and you want to see that, you click the time and boom, it goes right there on YouTube. You can see it right away. Right. And you can get them right up above me here on our, our homepage here at vobs.tv, which is almost ready to be relaunched. <laughs> I can taste it. It's almost ready. Uh, we're here live every Monday night, 6 p.m. If you're in the greater Los Angeles area, we'd love to have you be in our studio like Maxine and Mike Orenstein. A friend of mine from Buffalo, who is also in Los Angeles. Far out, we man. We went, went to the same synagogue, know a lot of the same people. <laughs> it, we, absolutely. Uh, so he's, he's here tonight. Uh, and um, if you'd like to be here, write to us at theguys at VOBS.TV. We'd love to have you here in our studio. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, show us your booths. Huh? You know, yeah, no, your booths. We, we usually have like somebody else's booth, but now no, we've just got the swaying palm trees here. And uh, we'd like you, if you've got a great home studio, take it in landscape, landscape. not portrait, and send it to us at the guys at VOBS.TV, and uh, we will we'll feature your booth on our show. That's right. Uh, let's see here. We need to thank our amazing sponsors. Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. VoiceOver Extra. Source Elements. VO to go go. VoiceActorWebsites.com. And J. Michael Collins demos. All righty. Well, we need to thank Marcy for letting us be out here in the garage, which is awfully kind of her. Our producer, Catherine Curridan, for getting us great guests like Phil Proctor. Jack Daniel on chat room Hold duty your tonight. Hand over your heart. Yes. yes. Jack Daniel. Yes. And our floor producer, technical director, and all round nice gal, Sumerlino, for 
dealing with our incredibly patient. Yes, Sumerlina. Yes, Jack the goalie again for the show notes and Lee Penny simply for being Lee Penny. Come visit us, Lee, would you please? And uh, so that's going to do it for us. You know, we know this is not an easy business, but there's so many fun people in it, like Phil Proctor, who who can tell us all the great secrets to how to do it better. And of course, technically, we're here to help you out. So tune in every Monday night. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shot. Or VO. BS. Have a great week, everybody. And that- Yay.